Okay, awesome. I think it's recording and uh, hello everyone. Today we have um, a founding member of uh, UBC Free Speech Club, uh, Angelo, and a, a board member, I believe, Devita. And uh, today uh, we're going to talk about um, some of the things that the Free, Free Speech Club uh, from the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver is doing. And um, I'll start with Angelo, if you can start and then we can initiate our conversation today. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Angelo Sidor. I'm the director of the UBC Free Speech Club. Um, I've been that in that role for about two years now. So I help with the administrative side of it, hosting events, uh, managing some of the social media. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I technically wasn't one of the founders. I joined as a member and sort of over time um, got a greater interest in free expression and events and the social aspects. So um, yeah, that's my role. Perfect, Divita. Yeah, hi, I'm Divita. Um, I'm part of the executive. I joined because of a friend. Um, he actually just graduated, but he was the former president of the club. I'm super interested in free speech just because of where I'm from. Free speech is very oppressed in a lot of parts of the world. And fortunately, being in Canada, we get to explore that and we get to talk about issues that we couldn't have been able to talk about in countries that a lot of us are from. True, and I think and I think free speech, um, like we just had a July Fourth Independence Day for the American um, people, and then I was talking about somebody and I said that you know building a civilization on the idea of free speech is just a beautiful idea. Like I'm just happy with the part that it's a beautiful idea to build a civilization on that. So with all the uh, imperfections, perfections that America has that we still have a constitution and a civilization that's built on it. Which kind of brings me to a part where how I've been following UBC Free Speech Club for quite a years now and it's all started with uh, you guys hosting Jordan Peterson, members like Dave Rubin and then uh, controversial um, the American speaker, uh, the fast <laughs> uh, Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro, yes. And that was pretty uh, uh, so tell me about time, like, tell me, tell me how this happened, how this rolled out, why was it important for the club and for the university itself to host such controversial people and why it was important for you guys as well? Well, you know, it started somewhat unintentionally. Initially, um, we wouldn't host, host speakers. We would just host sort of social pub events. And then Jordan Peterson sort of blew up in popularity around late 2016, early 2017. And I had the idea of, you know, what's, what's stopping us from just flying this guy out here? He's not that well known at the time. He won't have a, an expensive honorarium. And he asked for like basically no money. Um, so it was just a random idea that we did. And it was so successful, not only as an event, but as a social networking event where people go and see the lecture, they go out for drinks afterwards. It's a good nexus for freedom to not only listen to an interesting discussion, but also meet other people who also want to listen to interesting discussions. So we hosted Jordan Peterson about five times overall, yeah. which was, yeah. you know, a great experience every time. But that sort of unfolded into other speakers like Ben Shapiro, which, which you mentioned, where that was probably our biggest one, just in terms yeah. of size. We, you know, sold out a theater um, in Vancouver, of all places, a pretty liberal area. Um, and it is considered controversial, right? But it, it's because of that fact that we did it. I think it's important to show ideas that are considered controversial because we want to find out what the truth is. You know, it, it's what you talk about in Canada and in the United States, what we have as freedom is so delicate and so unique. Like, I think I myself am Greek. I grew up in Greece. I think a lot of immigrants especially have a good understanding of how precious everything is here it can it can go away very quickly so that's where the events side of it came into the picture okay and i and i was also aware of there are a lot of grown criticism from for you guys and have to you have to face as a as a, as a group just to have people over and have a conversation like basically inviting speakers is just having conversation the discourse so you guys create a lot of backlash on it if you want a little bit expand on that as well yeah, I mean, it's something that was almost expected at some point, but it really, it turned into something ugly when there were all these accusations being thrown around, like a popular one uh, among certain groups that were somehow a white supremacist group. 
but it's, you know, you hear that and it's so absurd because our, our previous president was Jewish. Davida is clearly not white. I don't know what I am as a Greek. Greeks are sort of in a weird middle ground between white and not white. But it, it's, and then if you're not white, they'll just say you're just a token for, you know, white supremacists to use the platform hate. Yeah. So, you know, it's a real problem. I mean, I don't know what Davida thinks about that aspect. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to have bring it bring Davida as well in the conversation because, uh, like, you're still in the like you're in the university undergrad student and being uh, from a different background. As the biggest acquisition for the club was that it's a white supremacy group, and clearly you're not uh, fit into that uh, idea. What do you think about it? I know it's super challenging because uh, I will host events and then we will receive a lot of backlash for said events. One example is we held a vigil for the George Floyd. Um, and, you know, I went right after a BLM protest (laughs) and there's people calling me a white supremacist and attacking us online. I had a professor actually reach out to me and, um, just to warn me because I had, um, put the poster up on Twitter and he warned me that this is a right wing fascist group and I should be careful. And I had to tell him that, no, I actually am hosting this. I'm a part of the club and yes, we do hold controversial speakers but that's the very testament of free speech. Absolutely. How is the, what do you guys think, David, and I wanna specifically, uh, maybe you can bring an idea as well, um, perception. How, what is the uh, environment of, uh, you know, tolerance in, in universities? Like there's a lot of, like, you know, universities have seen to be grown intolerant, especially in the down Southern states and in Canada about people having just different perspective and uh, maybe, you know, it's not inciting hate or violence against a specific minority or specific groups, but just having a difference of opinion. How is that? Why do you think that happens in the universities which are publicly funded? I mean, personally speaking, what I have seen is that as universities and people grow more PC, more so afraid of hurting different groups of people, it becomes, everybody's very cautious with new ideas Nobody's going to really speak out if they disagree with ideas. One example could be, for example, I I also study Indian history. And when we discuss things like the Khalistani movement, when we discuss things like riots in Punjab, it's, it's a very interesting approach that professors take. And so I think that it's detrimental for us on campus and in an, in an academic society to have this sort of approach where people aren't able to speak freely about what they believe, or not even about what they believe, but just if they disagree with certain principles. There really is not much dialogue that is open at all, is what I have seen personally in my classes and on campus. But I I do think that is changing slightly. Okay, that's a fair idea. Angela, what do you think about it? How how do you see this uh, growing up? I think the interesting part of it, if you look at UBC, but I would say most universities, I think the vast majority of students want to go to school, get their degree, go get jobs. You know, a lot of people are in the middle. They're not necessarily political. And if you look at the censorship side of it, I would wager that it's really more of a vocal minority that wants to censor. It's just that we're all so tolerant that we just listen to someone, you know, to three people who say, cancel this speaker. I like to think that at the end of the day, most people do do agree with us. And I know that because we get messages every single day from people saying, I'm a student, I'm a professor, I love what you do, but I can't be public about it. So there's a censorship culture on campus, but at the end of the day, you, you sort of sit back and realize that we're all just sort of walking on eggshells um, over a few radicals that don't want free expression. I, I genuinely believe the majority of people agree with us but everyone is so frightened to to express Mm -hmm. it so it's really fascinating talking about frightened what do you think like i understand why but people be frightened because you know people can be put on the social media and they could be what you call digital lynching right now people can lose their jobs or their status or you know whatever they have been built upon but why do you think that universities who are the uh, the places of uh, you know um, science and innovation and research and like you know free speech this whole epitome of free speech like why do you think universities are infected with this idea 
of not allowing a different perceptions or somebody who's just having a different perspective? What do you think, Angela? I think, I think what initially happened was good intended individuals wanted to make a, the university space more safe, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is what the civil rights movement was about. A lot of that is virtuous. A lot of that is good because we want to have people of color, people of different uh, uh, genders. Everyone wants to feel included so we can, we can all learn together and experience education together. But I, I, I think the pendulum may have swung too far where we began valuing safety over freedom. And the definition of what safety is uh, became very postmodern, in my opinion. I, I think it got to a point where you know, it's obviously one thing that you want to be safe. You don't want anyone to, to lynch you literally. Everyone yeah. deserves to be safe. But at some point, I, I think people became so sensitized that they interpreted words as a form of violence. It's a very subjective sort of understanding. And I think the moment you accept that words could be violent, um, you get into a pretty slippery slope territory. And I, so I think it's something that happened over time. I think most people are sort of, not aware of it. I think there are a few professors and people that are in the universities that are sort of very ideologically opposed to free expression. And I think okay. just throughout the years, they, they created a climate that is not welcoming. I mean, if you look at it from their perception, they call it hate speech. So course, let's well, talk about what, into, yeah, we can get into what, what is, hate what is hate speech, speech right? Yeah, I mean, this, legally. This is a slope. Yeah. I mean, you can go into religious texts and you can find tons of evidence of being like outright hate speech and you can ban religion. So there you go. So there's like a slippery slope. But I'm going to bring an idea to, to, to the table and I'm going to have TV to expand on this. So being a woman, being a woman of color, because a lot of these safe spaces around, women, around the universities is subjected to, uh, you know, how Jordan Peterson had incited a lot of... Uh, a lot of population, a lot of demographic, which is believing to a certain idea of feminism. And then there was uh, same thing with Dave Rubin as well. So how do you see that the, as a, as a woman, because uh, Angelo just talked about uh, vocal minority, right? And I want to understand from your perspective, how does it uh, like take me into this? Personally speaking, as a minority, I, I do often find that I'm the only woman of color, sometimes the only women in certain disciplines, particularly if I'm studying like European history. And sometimes I will literally be the only woman of color in the room. Yeah. In that sense, it makes me feel uncomfortable. But at the same time, there's another kind of zone where, you know, people, another woman of color approached me and was just like, I feel unsafe because of Jordan Peterson. And I had to ask her, like, why do you feel unsafe? How do his ideas hurt you? It's not, it's not ideas that hurt you. It's, it's if people, you know, act upon certain ideas that make it dangerous. Yeah. And, you know, as university students, we need to be open to all of this dialogue. Otherwise, even if you disagree with it, how else would you be able to voice your opinions on it if you don't attend this talk, if you're not talking to this person? True. Sure. There's, there's the University of British Columbia and similar universities in Canada, University of U of T, McGill. Do you think these top tier universities have built an ecosystem which kind of doesn't tolerate uh, people with different opinions and, and, if, and, uh, and people who do have those opinions are, are being, uh, you know, I would not say as a discriminatory uh, behavior, but an ecosystem which does not allow these people to evolve and become successful in the academia. Angela? Yeah, I think there is an ecology that has been built around that. I mean, certainly there are still some divisions in university. We do know that a lot of women avoid the STEM fields. The arts tend to be more heavily prevalent with females. I think, I think it's happened. It's happened in these top tier universities where tuition is very expensive, where a lot of privileged people get to go to. And again, I think initially the intention was good. It was well-meaning but mm -hmm. I think it's spun out of control. Uh, and, and you just, you see it with everything we do. I mean, people, their interpretation of what is violence is so subjective. I mean, the fact that we're funding safe spaces, we're funding these yeah. sorts of things. Like, you know, when we brought Ben Shapiro, we had a meeting with the school and they said that because we're bringing Ben Shapiro, they have to activate the sexual assault center 
that night because they were worried people were going to be sexually assaulted as a result of the Ben Shapiro. Wow. Wow. So you hear wow. that and, and like, and he's a conservative and he's a conservative religious person. Like if anybody yes. has yeah. heard Ben Shapiro extensively, then you would know he's a hardline conservative and his values are come from a pseudo, not pseudo, but Jewish Christian faith, which is yeah. pretty much the part of the, the whole sect, right? So there's exactly. no part of the violence against women here. But, but I think what it is, is that we're so divided now because we don't talk to each other that we formed a boogeyman archetype of each side, right? Like the right side says the left are a bunch of radicals and Tifa, they want to burn everything down. Their side says we're, we're Nazis, we're white supremacists, we're fascists. And they, I guess they throw rapists in there in, in regards to the sexual assault center. So I think, you know, when I heard that, I sort of jumped back in my seat and you, the, your first instinct is to laugh because it's so absurd. But they're serious. They're they're completely serious, and and yeah. you, you think like, wow, like they're they're so out of touch with reality. How do you convince? Is it even possible to convince these people oh, of the difference? Oh. And, and you know, I, I think certainly Davida knows fully well how difficult it is to convince the other side. I mean, w- with the events that she does that tend to come from a more left leaning angle, um, yeah. it's difficult because people have such a terrible preconceived notion that it, it's just so difficult. I want to comment, like, I should not be, but a, a part of this is that I think a lot of people feel like in these places, in these higher places in academia and, and decision-making and policy-making, kind of have this privileged perception of an, an understanding of the world, which kind of doesn't sort of touch the surface of reality. I want to talk a couple of things while we uh, see if there's more things to talk about. I want to have a comment on uh, the cancel culture. Uh, I want to talk about the, the current happening in America, about the cancel culture, and then also the part of that. It's like, you know, I, I just saw a, a thing there. Somebody was charged for, um, for there was a Black Lives Matter mural, and then she put a white lady, put a black paint on it, and she was charged with, you know, whatever the misdemeanor or whatever you call yeah. them. But then the same thing for, like, people just, turning statues off the ground, right? So what do you, what do you think about that? What do you comment on it? I think it's, it's clearly a double standard. Um, I think, you know, you look at uh, somebody remarked the other day how Michael Kornberg, who was a governor at UBC, he had to resign recently because yeah. he, liked, he liked a number of tweets that criticized Black Lives Matter. So he was just tarred and feathered and thrown out of the academy. And then somebody had remarked how, how he could do that, but Trudeau could do blackface an uncountable amount of times and he gets reelected. So I, I think it's important to realize that a lot of these people who, who propagate cancel culture aren't acting in good faith. They're not good actors. They're doing it intentionally. It is a power thing. And, I, I, you know, it's really bad right now. I would say it's one of the worst periods at the moment where, you know, on our page, I just get message after message of different articles, different stories. Someone somewhere said something bad about Black Lives Matter and they lost their jobs. Then this person and that. It's happening every day to such a degree where I almost can't even keep up anymore. It's yeah. happening that rapidly. You know, yeah. sports teams changing their their names and, and streets are changing and, and these statues are coming down now. So, you know, I think, I think this is extremely serious. I, I have a terrible feeling that this Mm -hmm. is somehow you know jordan peterson and all those intellectuals back in 2016 may have been prophetic in the sense that they were warning against something really terrible happening in terms of civil unrest in terms of division in the united states i mean again we're, we're we're young we weren't around for the civil war or anything but to me this seems like the most divided people have been not only politically but in terms of perception of reality it's so so upside down. Upside. David, I want to bring you out to this part of the cancel culture. You know, being brown, like people are also trying to bring down the Gandhi statue, and Gandhi has been specifically talked about being racist, especially what his his uh, things have been in in the South Africa and how he has been. Uh, and you're a history major. I know you have talked and you lived in well in Africa as well. So. Talk to us, talk, talk to our viewers about the perception of how people of color are think about them. Because I know white people just can't talk about Gandhi anymore. Like for them, it's just talking about it, it's just walking you know, the shell of eggs. But I think we can, and I want you to expand on it. 
Well, I think the Gandhi thing is a bit of, there are two extremes to the whole Gandhi issue, right? There are people in India who think it is blasphemous to talk ill against Gandhi. And I think that's also a problem is that Gandhi was casteist. Like I have read his books and unfortunately he was racist and he was casteist. Yeah. And you know, when I, when I approach the issue as just a Hindu woman, I do find it problematic. But I, I, but I also do think that in tearing down a statue, I think it's more about symbolism, more so than an erasure of history. I do think cancel culture is a major issue, but I, I, I think the whole Gandhi thing is a very controversial issue. It needs to be, it needs to be addressed within the Indian public and it needs to be addressed in a way that it becomes less biased towards Gandhi. He's not a god, you know? You know, I grew up in India, um, spent 22 years in India, and I did Jones in India and then here as well. So Gandhi is, is different. Like I think Gandhi is a part of uh, people who are on the other side of the table talk about Gandhi being shoved down the throats of the Indian education and system being with the British imperialism and then there'd be people who those ex chief justice of India said Gandhi was a British agent um, like all right and then he had faced backlash but he just this just guy just talks about it I can quote him his justice caught to his name is and he just mentioned that Gandhi is a British agent and so then he talked about the people as well uh, and Gandhi, there was a bit of racism, especially with his character in South Africa, because of him siding with the whites uh, against the against uh, apartheid and against the black people. So uh, tearing down statues bring us to the other part of the conversation, where I would say there's a whole lot of things which uh, need to be talked about because a statue is a symbol of like even like confederation and all this a part of the civilization part of the society part of the uh culture but i think glorifying rather than acknowledging it is i think a difference and i think a way to go what do you think angel well you know it's interesting when it comes to the statues because you know davida and i had a conversation not too long ago about i had made a post sort of talking about how bad it is that they're tearing down statues of winston churchill and you know, he defeated Hitler and this and that. And she sort of educated me on the other side of Winston Churchill that I didn't know about that, that is, you, you know, yeah. Yeah. that, that I, but, but I didn't know anything about it. Right. So yeah, that's the, why, that's the history that Trump brought in uh, Churchill in his office when he comes in and then he, and the, when Obama was there, he put it out right in his, yeah. uh, in his white house. And Churchill is just, and then and we as a Canadian being, being a part of the Commonwealth, we just celebrate these heroes about Churchill. People quote Churchill when they are in this war crime mode and motivation mode. But this is just like scattering to see the kind of work Churchill did to the imperialism of the British. Yeah. And, the and I, again, I had no idea about that. So I, I understood that. But then I still took a step back and said, okay. He's, he's clearly not perfect. And clearly the, the idea of idolizing people in statues is, I don't think the point of that is to say these are perfect people. I think with Winston, Winston, Winston Churchill, it's like he, he had a lot of problems clearly. Should we tear down a statue of him defeating Hitler in Nazi Germany? I don't think so. Because at the end of the day, like if I had to pick between the two, I'll still probably go with Winston over Hitler. Like I, I, think, I think we've lost nuance in the culture there's a way to look at things in a nuanced way it's the same with gandhi it's the same with sir john a mcdonald is a topic now like certainly controversial you know I, I knew about washington like again Lincoln. you know yeah. name like who who could we build a statue for that is a perfect human being there is there is nobody right so i'm i fear while i understand churchill had a lot of crimes I fear that if we erase history, we might be doomed to repeat it. Will UBC Free, Free Speech Club host an event on Churchill and talk about Churchill and Gandhi? Do you think, Nivita, do you think uh, a, a conversation around Churchill had to, uh, has to happen in, in, in Commonwealth? Personally Please? speaking, I just, I just wanted to speak to one point that Angela said, is that we're losing our nuanced way of looking at all of these, all of these historical figures. I think... In speaking to that, you know, Angelo, if you're looking at Churchill and we look at just like, you you were not aware of the millions of deaths that he was personally responsible for in yeah. India, in places like Ireland, you know, in places like Africa. Africa as a continent has seen 
genocides, countless genocides within the Bengal, last Bengal, one point two million people in three, like in this whole four, span. Four and a half million people in Sorry, my bad. Four half. Like, I mean, come, come, okay. the whole thing. East but like, West, that's yeah. what I mean is that looking at it from a nuanced approach is also looking at it from which approach. No yeah. approach has ever been nuanced. This is the only time in history where it's actually revisionist, where we're actually looking at the other side, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, talking about it, the revisionist. We started a conversation with that same topic. Exactly. Is that looking at Churchill, personally speaking, if you talk to anybody from Ireland, anybody from India, they have a completely different approach to Churchill because at the end of the day, he was not saving Indian lives. He was not saving black lives. He was saving white lives. So that's, that's the nuance that you speak of as a white person from Europe. You think, you think, is there, is there a conversation coming up? Is there, is there, do you think uh, UBC Free Club is going to host a... To be very honest, I think things like this are very irrelevant. Like I think cancel culture is so irrelevant. There are so many more bigger issues in the world that we should be focusing on, personally speaking. But I also think that it's really hard to start really hard conversations on campus. An example is the Kashmir conflict. I had reached out personally to people, to professors, um, to the Kashmir organization, and they were unwilling to talk about this issue. They were unwilling to engage in dialogue. Because Kashmir is a different so, issue, and we can talk about lens for an hour on Kashmir issue. I know, but these are serious issues, right? Yes, yeah, 100%. That's that we should be focusing our time on serious issues. It's okay. not always just Churchill or not, not all of these like historical figures that no longer have an impact on our daily But they do, in, not in our daily lives, but the policymakers, the people who are the positions of decision making, they do inspire from these people. Right, uh, they quote Churchill, and I'm just going to move away from Churchill and come come to quickly because we should. I want to. I want to let, let both of you pick who is going to talk about it. I want to talk about what UBC Free Speech Club, Free Speech Club is going to be doing the next coming year. What are the few things that you guys are going to be focusing on, and um, and then we'll go on the last point and talk about what what we take it from here. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean. In terms of this year, this is a bit of a weird year for us because we started out in January with an event with Andy Ngo, who yeah. is uh, he's a mm-hmm. Vietnamese center right journalist Putin. who was yeah he was assaulted by Antifa. So we got him, and he was going to do a lecture on understanding radicalism, understanding Antifa violence. And the school, um, for the first time, they've never done this before, but they just called us one day and said, "We're canceling it. We don't want to do it." And the reason was health and safety. They didn't think they could secure it. Normally, we have the option to hire security, and they charge us a lot for that. They said that's not even an option this time. So what we did was we said this is an infringement on the yeah. Charter of Rights. So we, we retained lawyers from the Justice Center of Constitutional Freedoms, and we are taking UBC to court. We are suing the school. Um, but as a result, essentially, we've been muzzled. Um, by the school because they constantly want to violate the charter. So we we were in a strange position in January and we thought, well, let's try to host someone anyhow, and then COVID hit. So mm-hmm. that sort of took, took things away. In terms of the fall, um, we want to see what we can do. We're certainly going to do pub nights because we've always done those. We're certainly going to try to have discussions. But in terms of bringing interesting speakers, um, a lot of that is, depends not only on COVID, but on the school and our lawsuit against them, we just signed, well, I just, I just swore an oath to my affidavit the other day. I know Davida is doing that tomorrow. Um, this, is, this is a legal case that could set a precedent yeah. for, for, for the rules. I mean, the and for the public the school, money, for the public money, public endowment that these universities is getting and things, you just can't allow uh, people to not have uh, disc- discussions and, and discourse yeah. and conversations. Just and it's emboldenment too, because they yeah. said, look, we, we got violent threats from Antifa, so we're not going to do it. I said, you're emboldening them then. You, yeah. you are essentially yeah. giving them the keys to, okay. to the culture and saying you can, they can do whatever they want with no repercussions at all. I mean, so it's turned into a, a really big lawsuit. Um, we'll see what happens. I, we're very happy about the fact that uh, the Justice Center is, is representing us pro bono. So we don't have Perfect. to pay or anything like that. So they're, they're a charity that basically focuses on freedom, constitutional issues. So they're, they're really fantastic for that. Um, but we'll see. I, I, I think we should try to host 
an event or a speaker and if the if the school cancels it it just adds to our legal case it does devira uh, what do you think uh, as a part of the ubc free speech club that uh, things that i done and should just mention that you guys will be focusing on and some of the things that uh, you'll be doing in the coming academic year yeah no i personally have been focusing on more global issues um but i do think that's just a different approach that i bring to the club i think it has been really interesting to see how andy knows issue played out it was shocking for me personally to see something like that happen on a university campus in north america in canada yeah. where you know the freedom of speech and the freedom to speak is a right so i think i think especially in terms of that it's kind of enlightened me to how bad it is over here and how bad we need to focus on on a university campus on different speakers and bringing them in yeah i think also in the perception of academics and the history as being a being a history student that we were talking about it i think the i think the pers- the perspective of the history being told like i was just watching the stand up comedy and then this guy told about asks about somebody from the uk audience said what do you guys learn in history and it's like must be sucked to real learn to know the real history right and uh, and they don't teach that right none of the british schools teach the british history and i think there's a this order discussion that needs to happen around the imperialistic history about the oh, british it can go the, both ways it can yeah. go both ways i mean that that's my whole thing with the winston churchill thing for example is mm-hmm. i didn't know mm-hmm. so if it weren't for free if it weren't for devita's ability to freely express herself to me Absolutely. i wouldn't know about it so Absolutely. it goes both ways right <clears throat> i i tell people it's not like free speech is not a, a western sort of conservative person's issue it's not left or right it's just a freedom issue to have the ability to to find out what the truth is yeah and you're right and on, i think on that note um if there is something that you guys want to add to a conversation i'm happy to take your last comments and then we can probably close in this uh conversation uh both of you any any last comments for us or for yourself or for well, us for the... i'll just say that i commend you for doing the interview with two uh accused white supremacists apparently um it's it's uh it's highly commendable we appreciate it and i pretty much any time we have a conversation with with media that is above 5 minutes long like it, it's a good feeling because we understand that it's not just us right it's yeah. not just we're not alone in this because a lot of times that's the scariest feeling is oh no it, it, the cancel culture and everything what if what if we're all alone what if we're the bad guys what if you know you you start to self question yourself but it's good to have these conversations like we've had now because you realize like you know i think i think we're we're on the right side of history so Yeah. I think we will be and there'll be and you'll be surprised there tons of people on the world from different part of the world in different in China and Pakistan and in Iraq Iran that they're doing some great work and talking about these things to Vida. Yeah no I just wanted to say thank you Gunit for hosting us but also that you know we all have the internet to educate ourselves on issues yeah. right we're living in an age of information that we should take advantage of the whole Churchill thing I didn't learn about him in class you know yeah. it was doing you know exactly it was doing personal research and ensuring that you don't just pander to certain news agencies you're not just you know just listening to certain people talk because there is a lot of but yeah no thank you for hosting us this is a great conversation thank you appreciate it thank you appreciate it and i probably talk to you guys in the future as well and i wish you good luck with all the endeavors that you have at the club and i appreciate all the work that you're putting in for the free speech thank you thank you bye have a good much thanks onchlo thanks bye vida thank you